quick introduction. My name is Dr. Max Margulies. I am the research director at the Modern War Institute at West Point, and I am very happy to uh, welcome you all to what I believe is going to be our final War Council series of the year. So this is um, co-hosted with the Lieber Institute for Law and Land Warfare. I would very much like to thank the Lieber Institute and Professor uh, Rob Lawless for helping make this happen and, and coming to us with the idea to co-sponsor this event, uh, which is part of their ongoing highlighting of the important research and policy implications of proxy warfare. Uh, so with that, I will just introduce our panelists uh, and then we can kick it off. So we are joined today by Major Alex Deep, a US Army officer and fellow at the Modern War Institute. Major Matt McDaniel, a US Army officer currently signed as a strategist at Army Futures Command. And Major Jenny Maddox, uh, an officer and attorney in the British Army Legal Services. So they will discuss the operational, technological, and legal dimensions of the future of proxy warfare. Um, Major Deep, I believe, is going to get us started, if I have that right. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, I will turn it over to him. All right, thanks, Max. Really appreciate the intro and the opportunity to speak on the council here along with my fellow panelists. So again, my name is Alex Deep. I'm a special forces officer, having spent my special operations career in third special forces group with various deployments to Afghanistan and Syria. And so I want to start out with a very general claim to get us going that proxy warfare will be part of our strategic competition with our adversaries as we go forward. So President Joe Biden, before he became president, wrote an article in Foreign Affairs kind of espousing the, the good parts of proxy warfare and really partnered operations, kind of more of a light touch to military intervention compared to large scale deployments of our infantry or armor divisions. The interim national security guidance that the National Security Council published since President Biden took office says somewhat the same thing. We have every indication that the national security strategy and national defense strategy will have a big part of it dedicated to kind of partnered operations and proxy warfare. And I think some of the impetus behind that are perceived and real successes with the use of proxies, both internally to the United States and with some of our adversaries. So countries like Russia, we have this idea that Russia does a good job using proxies in places like Ukraine and Syria, but also in the disinformation space with how Russia spreads disinformation, often using proxy forces to do so, and in the cyber domain as well. And then Iran, with their use of you know, Shia militia groups and proxies in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen, you know, all pointing to how a country can be successful with a light touch military intervention that relies on proxies. Then even our own success in using partners and proxies in the fight against ISIS, especially in Syria, with our Syrian Kurdish partners that we use in the northeast of the country. And it's not difficult to see why you know, proxy warfare could be attractive to national decision makers. It offers a degree of plausible deniability. It's low cost in terms of blood and treasure. It tends to be more politically acceptable than some of our larger scale military operations. It's economically sustainable. It's a way of limiting escalation by keeping the competition below a certain threshold of violence that might devolve the general war. And it uses folks that tend to be local and have the local knowledge that are required for any successful military campaign, whether that's an understanding of terrain, you know, an understanding of sources of intelligence that are very important, or whether it's understanding local political and social dynamics. So all those things combined make a pretty attractive option when you're looking to use military force to achieve your ends. And you don't necessarily want to commit you know, divisions upon divisions of forces to achieve those ends. But it's also really risky, mainly due to the very simple principal agent problem that's inherent to any relationship of this kind where you want someone else to do your work for you. You know, in order for the sponsor or the principal to ensure that the agent, or in this case, the proxy, pursues the sponsor's goals and not just what the proxy wants to do, has all to do with control. And 
the best way to control proxy groups is physical presence of your own military or intelligence operatives or diplomats or whoever. But therein lies the dilemma for using proxy forces because the mechanism by which you control a proxy kind of runs afoul to the very reason you want to use a proxy in the first place because you don't want to do it yourself or you want to light touch in some way. And so with that dilemma, that balance becomes very difficult to strike. And if you don't strike it properly, a proxy can get you drawn deeper into a conflict. If a proxy starts pursuing its own goals rather than, your, rather than that of the sponsor, you know, if the proxy starts to commit crimes, whether local or international, there could be serious reputational damage for the sponsor, both domestically and internationally. And I know that my fellow panelists are going to talk a lot about kind of the international law consequences or risks inherent to using proxy forces. But if we do choose to use a proxy or a partner to achieve our ends, it's also important not to have rose-colored glasses when it comes to how our adversaries use proxies, because the Russian and Iranian models are not necessarily great when it comes to how they try to leverage proxies to achieve their ends. So Russia's proxies commit war crimes all the time, whether it's the Syrian regime during the civil and Syri Syrian civil war, whether it's the Wagner group in Syria, Libya, and sub-Saharan Africa, that is not a great metric and not one we should look to emulate necessarily when it comes to how we leverage proxies, because after all, Russia started the Syrian civil war with a partner that controlled the whole country. And, you know, spoiler alert, the Syrian regime still doesn't control huge chunks of Syrian territory. And with the Wagner group, it's a very unwieldy instrument for the Russian state that Russia tends to control using cutouts in the oligarchy of Russia you know, motivated primarily by money, you know, not any particular adherence or commitment to Russian foreign policy. So that's not great. And Iran's isn't much better, but they fall into a trap of the kind of breadth of their pitch when it comes to recruiting proxies. They're limited ideologically, you know, to Shia groups that espouse to more or less the Islamic jurisprudence of the Islamic Republic of Iran. It's really hard for Iran to recruit widely outside that very limited set of people. So you can't really imagine Iran recruiting effective proxies outside of the Middle East, and not even the whole Middle East at that. And so with both of these countries, you can see some of the problems of using proxies, whether it's from an international law perspective or from getting drawn deeper into a conflict because of their proxies behavior. After all, the Russian government in its intervention in Ukraine, ended up abandoning its proxies in many ways. Once you know, the folks in the Donbass started declaring people's republics of whatever, and the Russian Federation was not willing to commit the conventional force necessary to seize the entirety of the Donbass, and that's a frozen conflict now. And despite kind of our framing that maybe that's what Russia wanted the whole time, I doubt Russia wanted to seize half of the Donbass. It doesn't really seem to make sense. In the same way with Iran, Iran advised its Houthi proxies in Yemen not to start a civil war with the Yemeni government. Well, they did. And as a result, Iran gets pulled into a conflict that they did not necessarily want to commit those kind of resources to. So what does that mean for the United States? I do think there's an American way of proxy warfare that can be more effective than that of our adversaries. And the first aspect of it is that we use proxies as part of a broader strategy of irregular warfare. You know, whether you call the Russia way, the Gerasimov doctrine, or the Iranian way, kind of with the IRGC cuts force, you know, a separate doctrine, you know, we have a regular warfare where proxies are just one small part of our broader expeditionary partnered operations that we conduct to achieve our ends. So it's important that we kind of take proxies as one option among many when it comes to achieving our national security goals. You know, second, we have a competitive advantage over some of you know, the other folks who might use proxies. Namely, we have this diverse country, diverse military, where we have connections to cultures and peoples all over the world. You know, our pitch kind of isn't limited to a certain you know, ethnic group or culture or background. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my other panelists so we can hopefully you know spur some good dialogue thanks <laughs>
All right. Thank you very much, Major Deep. Uh, very thought-provoking comments. I think next up is going to be Major McDaniel, and then Major Maddox will take us home. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's really an honor to be a part of this discussion. Uh, my job is a strategist, and I'm currently assigned to the U.S. Army Futures Command in Austin, Texas. And my focus is on applying new and emerging technologies to the development of future U.S. Army operational concepts. So I'm really excited to talk about the future, which in this case means how the U.S. Army will tackle the challenges of great power competition, which will undoubtedly involve future proxy warfare. Uh, I'll make these remarks as brief as possible so we can have more time to answer your questions. Um, I want to highlight three uh, important considerations that I think will help guide our conversation. Uh, the first consideration I'll talk about is how technology will shape the future character of war and how proxy warfare will result in a greater dispersion of both lethal and non-lethal warfighting technology. Uh, the second thing I'll talk about is how information will be viewed as a strategic commodity in the future. And I'll talk about what that means for countries that are seeking to achieve their strategic goals through the use of proxies. Uh, and then lastly, I'd like to talk about how increased accessibility to lethal and non-lethal technology could allow non-state actors uh, like terrorist groups and criminal organizations to act as proxies uh, and which will really challenge the way that the uh, challenge the army in ways that uh, these groups previously couldn't. So uh, first, let me address technology and the future operational environment. Uh, it's hard to predict the specific trends of future technology, but it's safe to say that global technological innovation will likely shape the future character of warfare. And while things like deterrence and international norms and economic interdependence will probably reduce the likelihood of large-scale conflict between great powers. Our competitors will continue to find proxies to be an attractive alternative to direct confrontation. Uh, and this is primarily because proxies offer a way to achieve strategic goals uh, with less risk to the sponsor. Um, but as technological innovation increases, state sponsors will likely share their lethal technologies with their proxies. Um, and sharing technology with proxies isn't new, um, of course. You know, the, the U.S. armed the Mujahideen with advanced Stinger missiles um, to fight against the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Um, in the future, though, great power competition and a proliferation of new capabilities could result in a greater diffusion of technologies, uh, which you know, allows smaller states to acquire new capabilities that were previously limited to richer countries. So, some specific examples of these technologies might include swarms of inexpensive drones that proxies could use to conduct uh, attacks against armored vehicles or even disrupt air operations. Um, the modern use of drones demonstrated in the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, kind of shows how relatively small countries might use these kinds of technology to great effect in the future. Uh, and smaller states could also use next generation communications uh, that are enabled by high-speed networks uh, and even sponsor developed AI algorithms to coordinate their efforts and increase the speed of warfare. Uh, not all of these technologies will be acquired through arms sales and transfers from external sponsors. Uh, one of the interesting things about what might be likely in the future is that proxies will be able to buy commercial off-the-shelf products as these products become less expensive. And the proliferation of low-cost lethal technologies could allow even low tier powers uh, with the backing of sponsor states to present a substantial threat to traditional militaries on a future battlefield. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that competitors like Russia and China will probably be eager to sell new lethal technologies. Uh, and this could actually escalate regional conflicts between smaller countries. So the next thing that I wanna talk about is information. Uh, information is rapidly becoming a strategic commodity. Access to and control of digital information could become an important consideration in proxy warfare of the future. So established countries uh, that have a robust domestic manufacturing capability and technology infrastructure could help less advanced proxies use future communications and information technologies uh, 
to both protect and gather information for the sponsor. Uh, also, proxies are valuable to their sponsors uh, because normally they have a better local knowledge of physical terrain and non-physical environments that they operate in. So in the future, these proxies could improve their information gathering abilities by deploying constellations of automated sensors uh, throughout the future operational environment on behalf of their sponsors, which would give competitors an information advantage. Uh, in the cyber domain, malware and ransomware attacks against commercial and government targets could definitely increase. Um, you know, this is because proxies provide an inexpensive and discreet way to conduct cyber attacks and inflict costs against established states without tracing the action back to the sponsor. Uh, so an example of a strategic cyber attack would be like the 2007 denial of service attack on the Estonian government. Uh, in the future, improvements in AI could allow relatively unsophisticated proxies to conduct even more sophisticated attacks uh, with complete anonymity. Additionally, proxies can help their sponsors shape and influence regional opinion. So in the future, uh, we may see proxies generating deep fake images and videos uh, to create confusion and erode trust uh, to help their sponsor state achieve its strategic goals uh, with little to no attribution or traceability back to the sponsor state. So all of this really contributes to the importance of information in the future. Uh, finally, improvements in technology may change how we traditionally think about organized non-state groups. So for the last 20 years, the U.S. has been fighting non-state actors, often supported by countries that act as their principals, uh, particularly in states with weak governmental infrastructure. And this trend is likely to continue in the future uh, as competitors seek to support groups like insurgents or transnational criminal organizations uh, and even mercenary armies as their agents. Uh, so, you know, even private assets like commercial fishing vessels might one day be pressed into service as a proxy in the maritime domain. Um, but what's different in the future, however, is that advancements in technology could create um, or could allow these groups to become more self-sufficient. Uh, technology could let them operate in ways uh, that make them far more lethal than organized non-state actors have been in the past. Um, revolutionary weapon systems like hypersonics or supersonic missiles that could be launched from conventional platforms, robotics, autonomy, energetics, uh, AI-enabled data processing, could let future non-state proxies pose significant asymmetric challenges to the U.S. Army. Uh, and a resurgent of the use of private military companies uh, may become an even more important consideration in future proxy wars. You know, we're, we're already seeing how private military security contractors are being used by Russia. Uh, you know, not only do these non-state groups reduce risk to sponsors, but they can sometimes be more reliable than partnering with, not, uh, with state proxies. Uh, and they're still cheaper than military deployments. Um, another example of non-state uh, groups could be terrorist organizations backed by regional powers. Uh, and they could use drones to disrupt critical infrastructure, uh, things of that nature that we've already seen. So finally, nations often choose to enlist proxies because they're easier and less costly than deploying regular forces. So technological uh, sustainment innovations like 3D printing could make these non-state groups even more self-sufficient. Uh, giving them the ability to manufacture supplies and weapons uh, with even less support from their sponsors. Uh, so one last thing I want to mention uh, is that I've used the term principles and agents um, from literature to frame the conversation, but has, has already been said, uh, in reality, the interests of proxies and their sponsors um, never align perfectly. Uh, often they have different strategic goals that lead the agent to operate on its own. Um, so when we think about the future, and future technologies, it's important to consider how proxies that are emboldened with new technologies might seek to escalate conflicts for their own regional goals, uh, even in ways that their principles don't intend. Additionally, in cases where two proxy forces are fighting each other, uh, increased use of technologies uh, like autonomous robotics, uh, loitering munitions, uh, and of course, digital disinformation, um, these things may cross red lines and escalate the conflict exponentially, which in turn raises the stake for their sponsors. Uh, so with that, I'm really looking forward to your questions uh, and I'll turn the conversation over to the next panelist. All right, thanks very much, Major McDaniel. Major Maddox, take it away.
Thank you very much. Um, and to follow on from those fascinating presentations just given by Major Deep and Major McDaniel, I'm now going to change focus slightly to look at how international law can shape the future of proxy conflict. First, however, I must give the usual disclaimer and make, make clear that anything I say is very much my own views and not those of the British Army and the, or the UK Ministry of De Defence. So to address the question of how international law will influence the future of proxy conflict, it's first necessary to look at how the law impacts on states' use of proxies today. And I mean this in terms of accountability or how international law addresses states' responsibility for any unlawful acts or war crimes, as Major Deep mentioned, that their proxies might commit in the course of hostilities. Because clearly when states engage in conflict, they're bound by international legal obligations, including the principles of the law of armed conflict that many of you will be familiar with, um, such as the obligation to direct attacks only against military personnel and military objectives. And when states breach these obligations through the actions of their own armed forces, so if, if for example, their soldiers target civilians in the course of hostilities, the state's international responsibility is engaged and certain legal consequences automatically follow. The state's under an obligation to cease its wrongful conduct. It must make full reparation for any injury caused. And any states that are harmed by the wrongful conduct have the right to take countermeasures aimed at bringing the state back into compliance with its legal obligations. But today I'm concerned with the situation when a state's legal obligations are violated not by its own military personnel, but rather via a proxy. And let me give an example. Many of you may be familiar with the Turkish incursion into northern Syria in October 2019, known as Operation Peace Spring. Turkey conducted this operation via its own forces, but the state also acted via a number of Syrian militia groups. And in the course of that operation, these militias conducted, um, they committed horrific atrocities against the local Kurdish population, including the execution of a female Kurdish um, politician and, another, and a number of other civilians. So if Turkish soldiers had committed those acts, then Turkey would bear international responsibility for the breach of the law of armed conflict, and the consequences I referred to a moment ago would follow. But when the acts we're concerned with, in this case, the unlawful killing of civilians who are not participating in hostilities, when those acts are committed by a proxy rather than directly by the state, the legal position is less clear. Clearly, there might be a reputational impact on the state. And also, looking at it from a purely moral perspective, it seems that Turkey should bear some form of responsibility for the malicious behaviour. Instead of using its own armed forces to complete the operation, Turkey chose to send these undisciplined militias to take control of areas of northern Syria. And in so doing, those militias acted in a way that violated Turkey's obligations under the law of armed conflict. But what does international law say about this? Well, the legal position here is governed by the law of state responsibility. And a key element of this body of law is that it provides for states to bear responsibility only for their own conduct, meaning conduct that is attributable to the state. If conduct is not attributable to the state, it remains private and the state bears no responsibility for it. Now, this is potentially problematic. Why? Well, because international law makes a clear distinction between conduct that's public for which the state bears legal responsibility and conduct that is private for which it does not. But that position in law does not reflect reality, particularly in situations of conflict where the lines between public and private conduct are frequently blurred. This is illustrated not only by Turkey's use of militias to fight on its behalf, behalf in northern Syria and also in Libya and in Nagorno-Karabakh, but also the many other examples of states' use of proxies given by the earlier panellists, Russia's use of the Wagner Group, Iran's use of Shia militias, states' tasking of private hackers to act on their behalf in the cyber domain. In the reality of armed conflict, it's actually very difficult to draw a clear line between public and private conduct, but that's exactly what the law of state responsibility seeks to do. So how does the law of state responsibility draw this line? Well, it does so through certain rules of attribution, which determine when conduct is attributable to a state and when it is not. And today I don't propose to talk about these rules of attribution in any detail, but what I will do is outline the main grounds on which harmful conduct perpetrated by a proxy could be attributed to a state, and also highlight certain deficiencies in the law that are relevant to the topic we're focusing on today, the future of proxy warfare. So there are two principal reasons why a proxy's conduct might be attributed to a state. First, because of the provisions of the state's own domestic law, and second, because of the factual situation that exists between the proxy and the state. So taking the very clear example of a state's military personnel, states' domestic laws typically designate their armed forces as forming part of the state and acting on the state's behalf. 
And this means that all military personnel are classified as state organs and their conduct uh, committed in that capacity is attributable to the state. And this basis of attribution, it can be relevant to entities that start life as a proxy. So the IRGC, for example, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, emerged in the early days of the 1979 Iranian Revolution and was then formally integrated into the Iranian state by a decree issued by the Ayatollah in May that year. So as a consequence of that decree under Iranian law, the IRGC's conduct from May 1979 onwards is attributable to Iran. To give a more recent example, some of the Shia militia groups in Iraq form part of the Popular Mobilization Forces, or PMF, that were integrated into the Iraqi state in 2016. So when such groups target coalition force bases in Iraq, for example, their conduct is attributable to the Iraqi state, notwithstanding the perhaps greater influence that neighboring Iran exerts over their conduct. There's also another basis of attribution that ori originates in a state's own internal laws. And that's when a state empowers a private entity to exercise public functions on its behalf and does so in a manner that accords with its domestic law. And the classic example here is the outsourcing of public functions to a private military company in a combat zone, such as base security, the interrogation of detainees, or even participation in com com combat. And to give a recent example, you may have seen on the news that Mozambique recently contracted a South African PMC, the Dyke Advisory Group, to fight on its behalf in the recent conflict in Cabo Delgado. Now, if this particular PMC was properly empowered to act in accordance with Mozambique's domestic law, it means that the alleged indiscriminate attacks that the group conducted in the course of the hostilities are potentially attributable to Mozambique and potentially engage the state's responsibility. In contemporary conflict today, however, it's actually rare for proxies to be to formally authorise, uh, to be formally authorised, sorry, to act under the state's domestic law. Russia doesn't empower the Wagner Group to act on its behalf through its domestic law. In fact, Russian law outlaws the use of private military companies. So despite Moscow's regular use of the Wagner Group and other PMCs, Russian law doesn't authorise these entities' activities. It prohibits them. Iran doesn't authorise Shia militia groups to act on its behalf via its domestic law. It empowers them to act informally, for example, providing them with training, equipment and salaries. So often there is no domestic law basis for attribution and we need to look to the factual situation between the proxy and the state. But here again, we run into difficulties. Evidentially, it's extremely difficult to prove that a proxy was acting on the state's instructions or under its directional control. And this is likely to become yet more challenging in future for the reasons outlined by Major McDaniel. If proxies increasingly act on state's behalf in the cyber domain or making use of new technologies such as drone swarms, in such circumstances, it will become much harder to determine who exactly launched the drones or the malicious cyber attacks, let alone whether those individuals were acting for a state. And to exacerbate the issue further, the control threshold that must be met for a proxy's conduct to be attributed to a state is extremely high. Evidence requir is required that the proxy was acting under the state's tactical control at the relevant time. Strategic or operational control is unlikely to suffice. And this goes back to the point that Major Deep raised earlier with regards to uh, the control exercised by states. Um, often they can control their conduct more if they've got actually people there on the ground with them, but then that makes it more likely that legal attribution will arise. So applying these tests to the abuses committed by Syrian militias involved in Operation Peace Spring back in October 2019, it seems unlikely that their conduct is attributable, attributable to Turkey. It seems that they weren't authorised to act under the provisions of Turkey's domestic law, and therefore the question centres on the level of influence that Turkey exerted over the actual abuses that they committed. But while reporting indicates that Turkey made the strategic decisions relating to the wider operation, Turkish officials appear to have had limited, if any, control at the tactical level over the militia's conduct. And so, despite the fact that the militias were clearly acting on Turkey's behalf, the state is unlikely to bear international responsibility for their conduct in violation of Turkey's legal obligations. And a similar conclusion is likely with regard to Russia and the Wagner Group, Iran and the many Shia militias, and the other proxy relationships that we see in contemporary conflict today. It's rare for there to be sufficient evidence of state control for the proxy's conduct to be attributed to the state, and the states that we see commonly acting through proxies on the battlefield, like Iran, Turkey, Russia, are well aware of this. So to conclude, what does this mean for the future of proxy warfare? Well, it means that states that choose to act through proxies can do so in the knowledge that they are unlikely to be held accountable when those proxies violate the state's international legal obligations. And therefore, unless the law evolves in some way to address this reality, 
states will continue to act through proxies for all the reasons outlined earlier by Major Deep and Major McDaniel. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, all of you, for your really great comments uh, from, a, from so many important angles on uh, proxy warfare. Uh, it looks like we already have a question from the audience, so I'm actually going to just jump right to Professor Sean Watts's question, and I'll save any questions I have uh, for later. So I encourage everybody else to think through questions that they might want to add, um, either in the chat or through the hand raise feature, and I'll do my best to get to them. So Professor Sean Watts asks two questions that may connect Major Deep and Major McDaniel's comments to, to Major Maddox's. First, are there are the principal agent control problems that Major Deep described an effective defense against the present international legal attribution scheme? Could a principal state cite departures from instructions or derogation by the agent to fend off or limit attribution? Second, what is the legal significance of the technology and information transfers that Major McDaniel predicts to existing international law attribution of agent action back to principals? Would transfer of tech or info alone be sufficient for attribution, or must the principal do more to bear responsibility? Major McDaniel, maybe you have some, some comments first. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, yeah, the principal agent dilemma, I think, is in, important to highlight, um, as, as we've discussed before, um, because we don't want to give the impression that it is a purely hierarchic relationship. Um, and there's a lot of complexity. Uh, each, each case is, is unique. Uh, and so when we talk about sponsors and their proxies, it's important to bear that in mind. Um, but the, the thing with technology and information is that uh, it's hard to close the box once you open it. Uh, if a state sponsor provides an AI algorithm uh, to their proxy, um, you know, there's no telling where the proxy will take that uh, technology. Uh, and the same is true for information. As the future of warfare becomes highly informationalized, uh, information uh, both about the physical battlefield as well as the non-physical elements of the battlefield uh, are going to become extremely important in that principal agent relationship. I think one of the challenges is uh, the attribution uh, of uh, proving the transfer of these technologies and the information because we're talking about a digital environment. Um, and so uh, while I think that the transfer of, of this information uh, is most definitely likely to occur, it'll be very hard to prove, I think, uh, going back to some of the attributional uh, statements that Major Maddox made, uh, that the transfer actually took place uh, at, at all and, and therefore uh, difficult to lay responsibility on the principal. If I could just jump in as well on that. So clearly international law, what it's looking for in terms of attribution often is this principal agent relation relationship. But the problem is that the, the thresholds are so high that attribution only arises if the, the proxy is really subordinate to the state to the extent that it does its bidding. And the problem is that that, it, that threshold is so high, it's so really rarely met. And there's such a broad spectrum of different state and proxy relationships in contemporary conflict. Um, so when you're talking about states transferring new technologies, um, et cetera, or even just you know, military equipment, whatever it might be to a proxy, then, then that's when we hit upon the problem that this public-private divide that you have in the law, that uh, conduct is either attributable or it's not. There's no middle ground. And I think that's one failing in the law. Um, so the, the law of state responsibility, for example, it provides that when a state aids or assists another state to violate international law, then that is internationally wrongful. But at the moment, the law doesn't seem to say the same with regard to when, an aid, when a state aids or assists a non-state actor, a non-state proxy to do the same. And I think that's one area where the law does need to develop so that if, if a state facilitates a proxy's uh, conduct that violates international law in some way, even if the proxy is not under, acting under the state's instructions, direction or control at the time, there needs to be some mechanism to hold states to account for that, uh, because otherwise there's nothing stopping them doing it. It's very difficult from a sort of practical, factual attribution perspective in the first place, but then the legal attribution becomes almost impossible. Um, and th there is no middle ground to reflect the many, many different ways that states um, do assist proxies in, in conflict. 
Great. Thank you, Major Maddox. I think we have a couple other questions uh, that you might be best situated to, to answer on the legal, uh, legal elements of proxy warfare. So Michael Schmidt asks if you could specify the, the distinction between state, res state responsibility for the actions of proxies and criminal responsibility pursuant to command responsibility uh, for war crimes by proxies, where might criminal responsibility lie uh, along those? And then um, Yelena Bieberman asks um, about whether we can learn any lessons from the state sponsor of terrorism framework, uh, how well that can be applied to thinking about um, the international laws that applies to proxies. Um, and this also kind of makes me think about not just the applications for international law, but whether there'd be any avenues for um, pursuit of, um, of redress through domestic law, even if international law isn't, um, isn't a good avenue. So a uh, lot to chew on, but I'll, I'll pause there. So to address Professor Schmidt's point first, sort of individual criminal responsibility sort of runs in parallel with state responsibility. They're separate, but um, in, a, in, a, in a way complementary, but the one doesn't rely on the other. So it may well be that um, an individual that um, aids and abets a war crime, for example, um, might be individually criminally responsibility, responsible, sorry. Um, but, it, but that individual criminal responsibility doesn't necessarily mean that the state is also responsible. Um, they, so they, they sort of run in, run in, in parallel. Um, and you can see this, for example, with uh, war crimes prosecutions um, in Yugoslavia. So we've got individuals that have been uh, found guilty on an individual level um, for genocide and, and Srebrenica. But what you, you, then there's a case in the International Court of Justice where, which considered Serbia's state responsibility for that. But because Serbia didn't control uh, the individuals that perpetrated the genocide, there was no state responsibility. So um, the one can arise without the other. Um, and I think in a way, uh, international criminal responsibility for, in, for individuals uh, is in, encompasses, it, it sort of holds, holds people to account better than the law of state responsibility in a sense. Um, moving on to the question on terrorism, that's not something that I've uh, actually looked at. Um, in any great detail, so I can't answer, answer to that particular point. Um, but what I can say is that clearly one impression I didn't want to leave from my presentation was that state responsibility or attribution is the only way to hold states to account. Clearly they can be held responsible in other ways. Domestic law is, is one way. And also um, they can be states can be held responsible for the actions of their own organs. If, for example, in um, their, the, the own, their own organs' actions in aiding or assisting um, a proxy, if that then violates international law itself, for example, if it violates the prohibition on the use of force or the pr uh, principle of intervention. Um, so it's not the only way, but I, I think it's incomplete, the law, as it is at the moment. Great, thank you. I would like to ask a question that I think we, we touched on a little bit, um, but it's something I've been thinking about, which is, um, I, I think, our, our discussion, and a lot of times we tend to think about proxies as, as weaker actors. Um, how likely is it that countries might be able to influence or coerce uh, domestic, transnational, private or semi-private corporations, uh, which often have their own extensive technological and informational networks and capabilities? Um, how likely is it that countries might be able to influence those kinds of actors in very similar ways to the way we think about armed proxies to achieve goals in the information sphere or cyber realm? Um, what might some of the consequences of that be? I'll leave that open to anybody. I'm certainly happy to start, I think, from a technology perspective. Uh, that question is really important. Uh, we see uh, here in the United States a uh, great emphasis put on industry to solve a lot of the technology challenges that we have. Uh, you need no look, look no further than companies like SpaceX um, that have uh, taken over a large role in our innovation space. Uh, and so uh, when we talk about assistance um, from private companies, um, I think that that, from a technology perspective, is, is a very real consideration. Now, in other countries, of course, uh, the relationship is different. Uh, and so if we were to change uh, that, that paradigm and look at 
industry in China or Russia, uh, we would likely see a different relationship between the state uh, and the, uh, the, the innovator. Um, no less uh, significant and important though, uh, because that may actually make it easier for the state to acquire uh, and employ innovations uh, from private sectors. Uh, and so as we look at the future of technology uh, and where we think technology is going, particularly when it relates to things like uh, robotics, autonomy, and artificial intelligence, uh, these are important things to, to keep an eye on. Uh, and uh, so uh, while I won't venture into the, the legal aspect, I'll leave that to the expert. Uh, I do think from a technology aspect that that's an important question. Great, thank you, uh, Major McDaniel. Did um, Major D for Major Maddox, did either of you have anything you, you wanted to add? No, I, I, just, I just think, and Matt brought it up, very well that it depends. You know, how much pressure does a state want to put on its own companies? I think that there's a cost there too. If you want to compel you know, a multinational corporation that's based in the United States to do something, well, maybe that affects you know, how they contribute to GDP in some way or hiring or this guy. So in a country like the United States, I mean, you saw just as like one example, how much, you know, Apple pushed back on giving a password to a phone you know, to, the, to the U.S. government because, no, we're not going to do that. You can't make us. Um, other countries are not like that, as we know. So you know, I think it really does depend on the country, as, as Matt alluded to. Awesome. Thanks. That's a, exactly the kind of example I was thinking about with my question. Uh, so it looks like Brigadier Keith Ebel, sorry if I'm butchering anybody's name pronunciations, um, has a question. Uh, given UK and US are entirely RBIO proponents, what are our views about how we can effectively respond and legally comply if using automated AI to address the diversity and speed of adversary proxy action? Um, will there be a safety catch and how should we address attribution or compliance questions against some entities? Yeah, sir, thank you for that question. Yeah, the, the safety catch is definitely um, something that we discuss from a concept development perspective. Um, how do you design these uh, future digital applications with potential warfighting purposes uh, so that we are um, being safe and legally responsible to do it? And I think that that kind of gets back to uh, what I was talking about earlier. Uh, the United States and the UK um, have very specific rules and, and, and laws when it comes to the development of future technologies. And in addition to that, uh, very specific uh, ethics and ethical questions to consider, not just with AI uh, and automation, um, but other things, um, you know, such as synthetic biology uh, and, and, and other new and emerging technologies. Uh, competitors may not have those same prohibitions. Uh, and so I think that it's uh, important to consider this um, both from our perspective and our, uh, and, uh, our, our competitors' perspective um, when we, we design these applications with potential warfighting capabilities, um, our adversaries uh, may not have the same prohibitions, our, our future adversaries may not have the same prohibitions on that uh, and may not have safety catches uh, to comply with international law. Uh, so, um, I don't know if that directly answers the question other, th other than to say that um, I think that the U.S., uh, at least uh, here from a concepts development perspective, are definitely thinking about those challenges and recognize that uh, competitors likely aren't going to think about it the same way we do. Great, thank you. Um, for Major Deep, uh, Professor Watts would like to know, are there political or military control measures that have been used successfully to avoid the problem of a principal being drawn into a situation deeper than it originally intended? I mean, yeah, so I can give kind of an example from our own history, and it really our own ongoing efforts in Syria is a great example of this because, you know, our partners in Syria you know, the Syrian Kurds, you know, the fancy name, the Syrian Democratic Forces, um, we don't want the same thing 
in Syria. You know, we have this kind of alignment when it comes to fighting ISIS, uh, but not writ large of how the Syrian Kurds see you know, their future within a Syrian state. And so when we first started assisting the Kurds, it was to fight ISIS, you know, because the Kurds were under pressure in Kobani, you know, more or less the center of Syrian Kurdistan. And the Kurds needed us to prevent a complete collapse. But once the Syrian Kurds had taken back the territory that is traditionally Kurdish, we wanted to then use those same people to combat ISIS in other places that were not Kurdish, like Raqqa, like the Middle Euphrates River Valley. And we put a lot of pressure on our proxy to do that, even though it was not in their interest to do so. You know, the Syrian Kurds were perfectly happy stopping you know, much further north than they ended up going in Syria. And we apply pressure based on making the provision of aid contingent on their continued operations against ISIS, you know, being able to link the aid we provide them with their ongoing focus on ISIS and not on other things like the Syrian regime or on Turkey, you know, being, you know, namely the two folks that we do not want our Syrian partners fighting, you know, in Northeast Syria. So I think just being very precise with the provision of aid or military support, you know, demonstrating that you're willing to, you know, draw lines and not provide support if your proxy starts doing something else, and then a willingness to walk away. And we saw that, you know, to kind of catastrophic result, and Jenny brought it up with the Turkish invasion of Northeast Syria in 2019. You know, our Syrian Kurdish partners, proxies, put a lot of pressure on the United States to do something about that intervention, that Turkish invasion, and we decided not to. You know, that was a very deliberate national level decision to not intervene in what Turkey was doing in Northeast Syria beyond rhetorical, you know, beyond telling them they ought not do it and there'll be kind of consequences, you know, to our bilateral relationship. But at the end of the day, you know, we didn't do anything to stop that. And so being willing to walk away, to not get drawn into a conflict you don't want, and being able to say that, yes, you're a good partner, but you're not worth messing up NATO. And that's hard. You know, when you develop those personal relationships with you know, partners you've been fighting alongside, who have sacrificed a lot. Um, but that's the name of the game you know, when it comes to proxy warfare. So you know, I think that's a good example of how we prevent getting drawn into a deeper conflict. Because that could have gone a lot differently and a lot worse kind of geopolitically. You know, for the United States. And if I could just jump in on a, from a legal perspective on that as well, when you're clearly acting with a proxy that doesn't necessarily share uh, the state, the same aims of the state. So it means that, you know, even if the proxy is dependent on the state for equipment, for training, for salaries, what it, whatever it might be, the proxy might then use whatever the, the state sponsor provides for its own purposes and not for the state's. And then that raises additional questions with regard to the issue of attribution. So in what circumstances, you know, if the uh, proxy goes off and acts um, on, it, on its own, on a whim of its own, instead of doing the state's bidding, uh, then that can also raise complex questions from an attribution point of view, which are often quite difficult to answer. And equally, the, uh, the answer that you get would potentially depend upon the basis of attribution in the first place. So if it's a, if it's a state organ, so military personnel, then even if they go off um, and commit war crimes, if they're acting in their capacity, they're employed on operations, then the state still bears responsibility. But if you're looking at this factual situation of instructions, direction and control, then that's drawn a lot more narrowly. So unauthorized conduct is far less likely to be attributable. Major Maddox, I'm not sure if you saw, um, as, as you started answering that question, another question came in that looks like it's, um, you may have addressed it already in some of the um, um, legal standards are just over my head, but it looks like Professor Watts would like to, uh, to get a, a very applied take on whether Major Deep's description of the uh, relationship to Kurdish forces, whether that's sufficient to establish direction and control for purposes of attribution and responsibility. And forgive me if you if that was already um, you know covered in, in your answer. <laughs> no, it, it hasn't been. And it, yeah. 
in actual fact, the conflict in Syria is one that I'm looking at in the course of my PhD research. So it's, it's something I look at specifically. Um, and I think in that particular case, as in many others, it's one where clearly the US-led coalition is providing an awful lot of support and training um, to the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, in their operations to counter ISIS. But I think it's highly questionable whether the actual level of control um, exercised by the United States or its allies is sufficient um, to meet the thresholds within the law of state responsibility. As I mentioned earlier, it's really only when you've got, in essence, tactical control by the state that the effective control threshold, as it's known, is met. Um, and although you know, US forces may accompany um, the SDF on some of their missions, whether they're actually doing so in a command role, well, often the evidence simply isn't there. These are covert soft operations. And so even if you wanted to try and argue that uh, they were acting under US effective control, for one, that's very difficult evidentially. Um, but for two, often, you know, with certain, um, certainly the more enablement um, aspects of, of the operations when they're not out on the ground, I think the, the element of control might not be there. So um, I think on some company missions, it could be. But I think it, when you're looking at the sort of broader operations, I don't think it would. Great. Thank you so much. We're, unfortunately, we are just about out of time. We have a minute left. So with that, I just want to really extend a sincere thank you to Major Deep, Major McDaniel, Major Maddox, and to the Lieber Institute uh, for, for organizing this event. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and I hope to uh, be in touch with all of you in the future. From all of the folks here at the Modern War Institute, we would like to thank you for watching our videos and invite you to explore our podcasts and our webpage linked below.